500 years ago in Tuscany, Leonardo writes that the average person looks without seeing, hears without listening, touches without feeling, breathes in without awareness of aroma or fragrance, eats without tasting, and talks without thinking. That was 500 years ago in Tuscany. So Michael Gelb is a best-selling author. His books include Mastering the Art of Public Speaking, Innovate Like Edison, The Healing Organization, The Art of Connection, Creativity on Demand. But today we're going to be talking about one of his best books, How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. Now, why are we choosing that book? Well, firstly, it sold 700,000 copies. It has been translated into 25 languages. And I really want to see this book hit a million copies sold. So with your help, let's make that happen. You can learn about Michael on michaelgelb.com. He is a remarkable thinker of creativity, innovation, leadership, and team building. But today, we're going to focus on ideas from the book, How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. Because on April 15th, uh, Michael, I believe it's Leonardo's birthday. Am I right? That is correct. Awesome. And so um, I'm a big Leonardo fan. When I was growing up, Leonardo da Vinci was one of my idols, the classical Renaissance man. So let's get started, Michael. How does one think like Leonardo da Vinci? And, and, and why, why would we want to think like Leonardo? To have a more beautiful and successful life is why we want to do it. And it's also lots of fun. The how was really very commonsensical. I asked myself the question, knowing that Leonardo had left more than 7,000 pages of notebooks, Bill Gates in 1994, Bill Gates paid $30.8 million for 72 pages of Leonardo's notebooks. Wow. And in these notebooks, Leonardo actually gives advice to his students on how to be more creative, on how to live a more beautiful life. So I thought, what if I read all 7,000 pages, which I did multiple times, with this question in mind, what is he trying to teach us? And how can that be translated into contemporary terms? So that was, that was the research. I also went to the place where Leonardo was born. I went to the place where he died. I literally walked in his footsteps. I interviewed the great Leonardo da Vinci scholars in the world, and I started dreaming about him. And from those dreams, these seven principles for actually thinking like Leonardo emerged. But it was more, I had to do more than just come up with the principles. So, okay, how do you really apply the principles? So I packed the book with practical exercises inspired by Leonardo to help us live those principles in our lives every day. Mm, I love that. I love that. And I, I'm so honored to have you on because when I was growing up, when I was 12 years old, I was obsessed with Leonardo. I was a big and Leonardo was my man. He was like the guy I, I wanted to grow up to be. Um, so it's really exciting to have you here. Now, what I, was, what I asked Michael to do to make this podcast something that would add incredible value to your life was to dive into his favorite chapter from the book. So firstly, I wanna encourage you guys to get the book, How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, and you can learn about it on michaelgelp.com or go straight to Amazon. But what we wanna do here in this podcast is deliver some hardcore value. I want you to walk away from this session with tools and practices you can apply in your life. So Michael has chosen his favorite chapter, and he's gonna break down some key ideas from this chapter. Michael, whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Well, I have to start with the disclaimer that all the chapters are my favorites <laughs> and that the chapters, the seven principles, the seven chapters do form a comprehensive integrated system for thinking like Leonardo and that each one builds on the previous one. And having shared that disclaimer, let's dive right into the one that Thanks to your invitation, if I had to think about which one is my favorite of all my favorites, it's the third chapter, Sensazione. 
sensazione is the Italian. I encourage everybody, wherever you are, say it. Put more dolce in your vita by engaging in la bella lingua, the beautiful language of Italian, and say sensazione, sensazione. It, of course, means sensation, sensation. And what it refers to is Leonardo's guidance that we awaken our senses, that we sharpen our senses. And most people kind of take their senses for granted. But what this chapter teaches and what I want to get people going on practicing right now in our session mm -hmm. is what's your plan for sharpening your senses over the next 10 years of your life? 10 years from now, will you be sharper? Will you be more sensorily acute? Or will you be duller and more hypnotized by the world of lowest common denominator media? Because the default setting of our world now especially is not designed to elevate your appreciation of beauty in all its forms. It's designed to just sell you a lot of stuff to which you will become addicted and that you don't really need and that doesn't serve the most noble purpose for your life. So what's amazing is 500 years ago in Tuscany, Leonardo, he's giving advice to his students and he says, the five senses are the ministers of the soul. And today, what I invite everyone to do is to, to focus for yourself and for your family on becoming the curator of your own soul by learning how to sharpen your senses and being very discerning as to what you invest your attention in. 500 years ago in Tuscany, Leonardo writes that the average person looks without seeing, hears without listening, touches without feeling, breathes in without awareness of aroma or fragrance, eats without tasting, and talks without thinking. That was 500 years ago in Tuscany. Imagine what Leonardo would think if he saw, if he just logged on for two minutes to any social media platform. So we need a plan. We need a plan, and, and what I'd like to do is take people through the five senses that Leonardo referred to and offer a practice that everyone can explore to bring more dolce to your vita. How does that sound? Love it. Cool. And let's just, let's just go right into uh, to sight. So how do you sharpen your sense of sight? One of, one of the most illuminating ways is to consciously appreciate art and think about who your favorite artist is and why you like them. But then it gets really fun. What we ask people to do is find someone in your life, you can do it with your partner, do it with your kids, do it with your parents. You can do it over Zoom and ask them to choose their favorite artist. And then just choose your favorite painting, for example. And we're talking about the visual arts here. Uh, it could also be a, a, an NFT. <laughs> choose your favorite NFT if you want to be very contemporary or choose your favorite artist of all time. Obviously mine's Da Vinci, but it could be Cezanne, or it could be Mary Cassatt, or it could be Picasso, whoever it is, whatever painting or work of art has moved you the most in your life. Choose that and tell somebody what you love about it. And then ask your friend to tell you what they love about their work of art. Now, what's really cool is if you, if you decide, okay, I'm gonna then give you my impressions of the work of art that you chose, and you give me your impressions of the work of art that I chose. Now, here's what happens, and here's the secret to this. This is a, a powerful secret 
for liberating deeper appreciation of all the senses. We're not asking you to analyze it or do an art history or art criticism exercise here. We're asking you, we're inviting you to say, what is it about this work that affects me and how does it affect me? What are my impressions? I call this the magic question for liberating appreciation. And the reason it's a magic question is it has no wrong answer. And what happens when people begin looking at art without having to get the right answer and just notice, well, how does it affect me? Something emerges and what we, so I, just so you know, I do this exercise with corporate people around the world and it gets them to actually look at works of art that have almost become cliches in a brand new way. And they sometimes say things, complete beginners say things that are so perceptive because it brings, you know, the, the contemporary word for it is mindfulness. They're present with the experience because the block of trying to get the right answer disappears. And then I encourage people, make a list of your 10 favorite artists and explain why you like them. And what happens is you're immersing yourself in the, in the quest for and the understanding of beauty. Then of course, we invite you to do the same thing with your favorite music. And it could be any genre. I actually, where is it? I made, I made a CD of my 10 favorite classical pieces and with explanation as to why I, I chose them. But the point is, whatever it is, R&B, hip hop, jazz, bluegrass, you choose what, what moves you the most get a friend or a group of friends. This is an amazing team building exercise. We get a whole team of people to choose their favorite piece of music, tell everybody what you love about it. And what happens is you start to listen through the other person's ears and psyche and heart. And here's the, the wonderful thing that happens. Not only do you come away with a deeper appreciation for the music, but you start to get that deeper appreciation for that other person and how they see the world. So I call this non-judgmental comparative appreciation. It's suspending judgment. And why comparative? Because our brain loves comparison. Our brain loves, you know, what's better than, well, one dark chocolate, because let's get on to taste and smell, which we're getting to my favorites in the favorites. <laughs> what's better than one dark chocolate? two or three. Mm. So and, and comparing, comparing the nuances between them. Yes. So you can take, I love this. I right? love so you can take two, like two, two chocolates of let's say 70% cacao, but from different places in the world, one from Madagascar, one from uh, Venezuela, for example. And then what's the coolest thing is you, you let it melt in your mouth and it transports you to Madagascar because great chocolate, just like great wine, great coffee, great tea, is an expression of the earth. You know, the real artisanal, obviously we want artisanal, fair trade, organic where we can get it, but the best the earth has to offer. And the great thing about it, one little square of chocolate and you just flew to Madagascar and are breathing that soil and feeling the energy of the farmers who brought that forth and, and, and made this incredible miracle available to you. But then you can go to Venezuela and what's shocking and stunning and amazing is the two chocolates are so different. They're both 70%, but from different parts of the world. Or do a tasting of a 70% cacao an 80% cacao and an 85% from maybe the same place in the world and tune in to what's the, what happens as you go up the cacao ladder and describe that to somebody else. I mean, this takes, try this <laughs> on your next that. date. No, this is, this is, this is so beautiful. This is so beautiful. So why I appreciate that is because um, I'm colorblind. 
So I have a condition called Daltonism. One in 15 men have it. I see roughly 5% of the colors that a normal human being sees. Um, and, you know, I'm okay with this, but I wonder, but my world is still looks so beautiful. I wonder what it looks like if I could see the way I could see colors the way normal people do. For example, I have no concept of this thing that normal people call purple. And red and green, I confuse those two, even though for normal people, these are so different. And it's not just me, one in 15 men have it. And so what I find is that I tend to pay so much attention to my other senses. When I have friends over, I will have 20 different types of chocolate lined up because I love the comparative tasting. I have 20 different varieties of tea and I make all my tea myself. I go and I buy loose leaf teas. I love making my teas myself and every tea is different. I'm pouring myself a cup right now. And so I love what you're doing because you, you've helped me give a name to this approach. I just, I, I thought I was just weird. <laughs> uh, because, because when you come to my house, you know, if you're, if you're a guest, I don't serve you a cup. I'm like, okay, so first we're gonna try the mango dance tea. Then we're gonna try this special feng shui tea. Then we're gonna go into this thing called pepper mundi. So, um, but, I, but I love it, sensazione. And what I'm loving about what you just said is how we can discover someone through music. So I want to assign a piece of homework to everyone um, over here right now. Share your favorite Spotify playlist, especially if you've created your own Spotify playlist. Share that on our private social network. If you're a Mind Valley member, let's discover playlists. But you know, I want to put this out there. Share the playlist that puts you in the best mood. I've I've actually gotten playlists from Mind Valley members I've met at events and stuff. Um, because sometimes there's a seminar and somebody goes, hey, I have this really cool playlist that I want that I think you guys should play during our, our, um, our, our break and you get addicted to the music and you discover something through that. So I want all of you, after we're done with this conversation, to share your most uplifting playlist in our private social network. And let's see what we discover from each other. I'll do the same. Fact, well, Leonardo would be very pleased with the invitation you just gave everyone, especially that the notion of in these challenging times, how do we uplift one another? And with music, obviously with chocolate and coffee <laughs> and tea, which is also one of my favorites. You know, I, I, I study and teach Tai Chi and Qigong uh, for many years now. And one of the traditions when Tai Chi teachers get together is we share fine Chinese teas. Right. And I was delighted to discover that all my favorite Tai Chi and Qigong master friends are also all tea masters. And part of getting together and practicing is a comparative tasting of teas. From all uh, Ken Cohn, Grandmaster Ken Cohn is, is maybe the greatest scholar of Qigong and Taiji in the world, and he's also a tea master. Tea is chi. Mm. Is there anything is there anything unique about tea? Because I remember visiting Lee Holden. Lee Holden is uh, is an incredible uh, Qigong Qigong master. He teaches on PBS. He's about to release a program on Mind Valley called Modern Qigong. All of you who are Mind Valley members, you're going to be getting that in your account in the next six months. It is remarkable. But when I first met Lee, he took me to a Chinese tea house in Santa Cruz, California. And um, we, we tasted like the most incredible tea where a single set of leaves in a cube this big could be, could be sold for two to 300 bucks. Oh but yeah. With tea, with, why, why are Tai Chi masters and Qigong masters so into tea? Well, we call it getting tea drunk you bond in a way it's it's again it's the same it's there's something there's a social element of it but there there is something that science hasn't even been able to figure out in terms of the the chemical structure that's in these fine teas that is just genuinely transporting i mean it's true of all these great things that are redolent of the earth uh, i wrote a whole book about wine as an inspiration for creativity. And my, I love tea, I love coffee, I love chocolate. I love to do this with, uh, my wife and I had a tasting last night of chocolates 
and oranges. And we also had, of course, two different Barolos with our, our dinner from the same fabulous 2013 vintage, but from two different mountains in the Longhe Hills of Italy. And we, we've driven our bikes through there. So this makes it even better when you visit these places because when you drive your bike through and you smell the air and then you're here in New York, but you're tasting this wine and this one smells like that hill and this one smells like that hill. So, uh, and, and here's, here's the, the bigger point, the bigger takeaway. I ask my students and I'm asking everyone now, on a daily basis, contemplate these two related questions. How can I make my life more beautiful today? What can I do specifically? And frequently it's, it's related to the appreciation of beauty. And what can I do to make life more beautiful for others? And what, it's, it's one of the delightful secrets of a more beautiful life. So one of the things I learned from my study of Leonardo's notebooks is that when he painted, he had his friends come and play music for him throughout the day. He perfumed the air with his favorite aromatherapy, which I, I, he says what it is. It's a combination of rose and lavender, which I actually have going in my office at the moment. There's a diffuser wow. right over there. He wore the finest fabrics that he could afford because he savored the texture, the feel of fine velvets and silks. So I asked this question in a seminar I was teaching a while ago for people who work at a VA hospital. And I said, how can you make your life more beautiful? How can you make life more beautiful for others? And there happened to be a group of nurses who worked in a PTSD ward of a VA hospital. And I, I saw their energy. They were so excited. So I asked them, say, what did you come up with? They said, well, look, we work in this PTSD ward and we're serving these veterans who are traumatized, but we realize they come into our waiting room and the news is on, which is blaring more trauma at them. And we just have a typical waiting room with newspapers and standard mag. They said, we're gonna transform the waiting room. We're gonna shut off the news and we're gonna put on one of those stations that plays beautiful scenes. We're gonna play beautiful, gentle music. We're gonna have a comparative art show. You know, we'll just get posters on the wall. We'll start with Monet and we're gonna put up Monet paintings on the wall. We're gonna get rid of the standard newspapers and we're gonna put beautiful, inspiring works for, for the veterans so that the healing for them begins as they walk in. They were so excited about doing this, but what it didn't just benefit the veterans, obviously, but everybody who works there, because they all go in through that waiting room. So in, in, if you just think about this, little things, you know, sometimes it just mean you smile. Sometimes you just a kind word. I love what Ken Blanchard says, catch people doing something right. So look for accurate things uh, to appreciate about other people. And in these small ways, you make your life more beautiful by looking for beauty and you make other people's lives more beautiful. I love There's that. Michael, I just wanna remind people, uh, this, what you're sharing here is, is part of chapter three of your book, Sensia Zone. Um, and you start with a quote by Leonardo. All our knowledge has in its origin, sorry, all our knowledge has its origin in our perception. And I love that you help to see that the, the importance of really, really basking in sensory beauty. Now, I, I want to explain that when you go into Michael's book, it's kind of like a workbook, right? So, for example, in this chapter, there's a self-assessment for vision. You answer questions such as, I'm sensitive to color harmonics and clashes. I know the color of all my friends' eyes. Uh, you are Now, that, that's the hard one for me because I'm colorblind. I, I can't tell my friends eye color. I literally don't know if it's green or blue, uh, but most of you shouldn't have an issue with that. And then he prescribes exercises, focus near and far, an exercise called soft eyes. He prescribes exercises you can do on your own and exercises that you might have to travel a bit to, such as making the most of museums. 
And then he goes on to, to giving you tips, learn how to draw, layered listening, listening for silence, learn, learn the major movements of Western music. So it's a really fun book because you're not just learning to think like Leonardo da Vinci, you're becoming more refined in your appreciation of everything that the world has to offer. And then he goes on to even give you a list of classical music pieces you need to listen to. The number one being Bach, Mass in B minor, Beethoven, Symphony number no. nine, number third, Mozart, Requip. So it's a really, really interesting book. It's not a book that you read, uh, that you read. It's a book you read, you put down and you go and you take action. You read, you put down and you go and you pull up these songs on Spotify. Uh, he, hasn't, he even has a list, and this is really interesting to me, American popular music that you need to listen to. Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein, Alan Lerner and Frederick Lowe, Irving, Ber Irving Berlin, really, really, really cool. So I, you know, I, I can see why this book has sold 700,000 copies and is about to hit a million. Yay. And for those of you who want to learn more, just go to Amazon and search for How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. It's an experiential book. Michael also has a course coming out on the book. Um, and you can learn more at Michael Gelb. That's Michael, as you would spell Michael, and Gelb, G-E-L-B. Now, what I'd like to do next, Michael, is I want to open the floor to questions. So we have a live audience with us. We have precisely 444 people live with us right now. Um, and so this is where it gets really fun. I'm going to ask all of you guys to go to the Q&A box that you will see on Zoom and either pose a question to Michael or vote up a question that you like. And I'm gonna bring up the uh, uh, two to three of you with the top questions so that you can ask Michael directly. So let's look at the question that's currently leading. It is by Talis Alves. And it's a really interesting question to a man like Michael who writes about the Renaissance man. It's a question on, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Talis ask this question, but it's basically a question on honing and becoming good at one thing or being or pursuing mastery over multiple things. So Thales, I'm gonna make you live. Feel free to turn on your webcam and let's have you ask your question. Thales, you are now a panelist. Welcome Thales. Would you kindly turn on your camera and your mic? Hey Vision, hey Michael. How are you? Okay, so uh, the question I have for you is, first of all, I've already read your book, How to Think Like Da Vinci. It's simply amazing. Congratulations. And Da Vinci was a musician, painter, mathematician, anatomist, engineer. So I see that it's important for us to develop multiple intelligences, right? And my question is, in your view, how do you reconcile having a variety of skills with pursuing mastery over one single thing, for example? Nowadays, I don't know if it's recommended for someone to try to have all these different professions. However, it's interesting to have a notion of how different things work. So how do you think we reconcile that? I love the question. Thank you so much. And it really is at the heart of what, how to think like Leonardo da Vinci is all about and why I chose da Vinci as the ultimate exemplar of expressing our genius potential precisely because he was a genius of both art and science, of music, he was athletic, he was a great storyteller, he had a great sense of humor, he was a chef, and people say he was even a really wonderful person. <laughs> so that, that sense of developing different abilities versus people say specialize in one thing, If we think about the word university, what it, what it comes from is the idea of universal knowledge. So first, quest for universal knowledge is part of what's so great about Mind Valley. There's a universe of amazing knowledge available through the Mind Valley community. Then we think about the liberal arts and the point of a real liberal arts curriculum was to give students a practical understanding of the universe, of the world, of the big picture from which you could make an intelligent, informed, principal decision on what you wanna specialize in. 
the key is to specialize without becoming narrow and to keep a universal vision without becoming a dilettante. And, and it's why the skill which you were introduced to because you read the book of mind mapping is such a fabulous tool that we teach in the book and in all my seminars. It's why I call it the methodology for thinking like Leonardo da Vinci because we need help seeing the big picture, looking at how everything connects to everything else, but then being really accurate and focused when we need to be so that we can be both precise, detailed, and imaginative and broad in our thinking. Okay, thanks a lot. So for example, uh, this morning I was uh, practicing piano, and but then, then I thought, wait, this is not aligned with any of my goals. So do you think how much time should we dedicate to these side activities? Well, tell me one of your goals. Oh, for example, uh, build a podcast, for example. So is there a way that what you're learning from your music might be relevant in your podcast? Very unlikely. Right, so what, what, and what, let's get into it though. Like a podcast has a rhythm and so does a song, right? There's yeah. a feel and a touch. There's an attunement, there's a repertoire. Uh, what do you want to play on the piano? Who do you want to have on your podcast? <laughs> so this is connezione thinking and the ability to link one thing to another is the part of the essence of creativity. And the more we cultivate, this is thinking like Leonardo, the ability to make connections that people don't normally make. That's what, that's what creativity is. And the more you play with something like piano and then tea tasting and then enjoying nature and exercise and reading and studying some, you know, a new language, the more you are inspired. Look, you've got a hundred billion brain cells. You can make more connections in your brain than there are atoms in the whole universe. So you can handle it if you just open up to all of it and ask another magic question, which was, which is how can I bring this all together in a way that moves me in the direction of my dreams and my higher purpose? Okay, thank you so much for your answer, Michael. My thank absolute you. pleasure, thank you. I wanna just add an, um, another aspect to that perspective. You know, there was an interesting question on Quora, the Q&A website, where someone, someone asked um, what it really takes to be a billionaire. And Elon Musk's wife, former wife, Justine Musk, responded. And she said something really interesting. She said, will you become a billionaire if you're simply determined to be one and put in the necessary work? No. She said, how you got to be a billionaire is to really master different things and then connect them. Elon mastered the art, mastered the internet. You know, his first, his, his, his first uh, money was made in web applications. Then he mastered rocketry. Then he mastered um, solar cells. He put all of these things together. And so what, he, what she said is to really be successful, you need to gain mastery in multiple things and then merge them, connect them. So this idea that we just focus on one skill is no longer necessarily true. So go, go check it out. It's a really interesting spin on it. The reason I think I could start Mind Valley is because I have a degree in computer engineering. So I knew how to build applications. I was a teacher of meditation and I was a photographer. And my first company was a web design company. And Mind Valley really became what it is because we, we were able to create some of the most beautiful designs and visuals and websites. And we were able to build beautiful apps. But all of that came from the unification of photography, web design, computer engineering, and most bizarrely, meditation. So I think there is an advantage you get from specializing even in highly disparate things, and then boom, joining them together. Okay, 
So Akshat said, what do you think of the genius tip? Psychologists, researchers at Harvard Graduate School of Education discovered that virtually all children up to the age of four had genius capabilities, but the proportion of geniuses in the population drops as the age group increases. By the age of 20, only 2% of the population retain their genius abilities. So firstly, is this, is this some myth, some pseudoscience myth, or is this real? And if it is real, why is this so, Michael? I believe the research suggests that it's real, and I believe every parent would agree that their child is born a genius. <laughs> you look in the eyes of your child, you see this unlimited potentiality, you see how fast they learn. If a child grows up in a home where there are five languages spoken, they'll learn all five languages. What they learn in the first four or five years life of life is, is just amazing. But then, of course, what happens is they go to school where they learn that answers are more important than questions and that conforming is more important than originality and self-expression. So children are born geniuses. They get de-geniused by the combination of school and societal pressures. And how to think like Leonardo da Vinci is, I call it re-geniusing. I, I'm here to help people re-genius. And the good news is you can re-genius at any age, not just starting at 20, but even at 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90. When I was 60, which is already eight years ago, I wrote a book called Brain Power, Improve Your Mind As You Age, focusing on the research validated things we can all do to get smarter and better as we get older. The brain is designed to improve with use, but it didn't come with a manual, which is why I had to write how to think like Leonardo. Beautiful, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for your question, Akshat. So with that, we come to the end of this, this podcast. So Michael, um, thank you so much for joining us. And for those of you who are intrigued by Michael's work, check him out at michaelgelb.com michaelgelb.com and check out the book how to think like leonardo da vinci when you go to michaelgelb.com you will see a list of all of michael's books all of his works and you can sign up to get in the notification list when his new course on thinking like leonardo da vinci emerges for the rest of you thank you so much for being a mind valley member and if you listen to this podcast and you're not a member yet go to mindvalley.com and learn about what membership means basically all of the world's top personal growth uh, trainings, programs, uh, and experiences are unlocked for you in a really beautiful way. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be with you. Thanks.